Welcome to the second video of the series devoted to singing early music. This session will consider English song and focus on one of the three fundamental aspects of early 17th century vocal delivery, pointing sentences. As much as possible, I will use documents from the time. But because contemporary explanations of practices do not always exist in any particular country, I will consult sources written elsewhere, both before and after the music in question first appeared. I will, however, endeavor to draw my reconstructions from documents written within a generation or two of the composers themselves. By doing this, we can at least make an attempt to avoid, to quote historian Robin Collingwood, the mistake of arranging in the past what is actually all present experience. There is none, oh none but you, that from me estrange your sight, who mine eyes affect to view, or chain it is here with delight. Other beauties Others move in you, I all graces find. Such is the effect of love to make them happy that are kind. Women in frail beauty trust only seem you fair to me. Yet prove truly kind and just, for that may not dissembled be. Sweet, afford me then your sight, that surveying all your looks, endless volumes I may write, and fill the world with envied books, which, when after ages view, all shall wonder and despair. Woman, to find man so true, or man a woman, and half so fair. You have been listening to a track from the album Secret Fires of Love, featuring tenor Daniel Thompson and lutenist guitarist Terry McKenna, that illustrates various facets of early 17th century performance. In Campion's time, speakers and singers use the points of sentences, what we call punctuation, to compartmentalize ideas and emotions in the text so that listeners could easily comprehend the sense of what they hear. Pauses then not only organize the content of a speech or lyric, but they also provided places for speakers and singers to change their pace so that the speed of delivery could match the emotional character of the clauses. These points primarily consisted of commas, colons, periods, and parentheses. The comma was the shortest rest in reading, was pronounced with a little pause, taken with or without breath, and lasted about the time of a crotchet or quarter note. Commas gave listeners a brief moment to reflect on what had just been said, momentarily suspending the sense. The colon was a longer pause, about the time of a minimum or half note, and it gave the expectation that much more was to be spoken. Charles Butler tells us in 1633 that the tone of voice, that is the voice's pitch inflection and volume, should drop just before a colon. The period signaled that a sentence was fully and perfectly finished and gave listeners time to reflect on the entirety of the sentence's matter. The 
The pause should not be shorter than the ear expects, and like the colon, the tone of voice should fall just before it. Parentheses, on the other hand, enable writers to insert some other matter into a sentence, almost as an aside, which is so short that its omission would not harm the sense of the rest of the sentence. Speakers differentiated the bracketed words from the other parts of the sentence through their tone of pronunciation. Richard Mulcaster suggesting in 1582 that parenthetical remarks should be delivered with a lower and quicker voice. A number of writers considered the comma to be an extremely important vehicle for effectively communicating ideas, for with it, to use the words of a mid-17th century writer, auditors may more easily distinguish the various members or parts of a sentence. In fact, Simon Danes thought the comma should be used in the most convenient places, and writers were already identifying these locations as early as 1551. Indeed, John Hart recommended introducing commas to separate what he called short sayings. That is, commas could be placed before prepositions, conjunctions, and relative pronouns. Moreover, Danes also suggests that commas are particularly useful in rhetorical speeches, where short pauses can bring greater majesty to the elocution through a kind of emphasis and deliberation. By this, Dane seems to mean that commas can help draw specific words and ideas to the attention of listeners. As this discussion shows, pauses were a vital part of effective communication, and speakers in the 16th and 17th centuries understood that only through the frequent insertion of stops could the meaning be conceived and the senses satisfied. This degree of compartmentalization continued into the late 19th and early 20th centuries, for leading actors in England, Italy, France, and Germany introduced pauses on some of their recordings as often as every third word. The typical late 19th century practice is plainly evident on Herbert Tree's 1906 recording of To Be or Not To Be from Shakespeare's Hamlet. I have excerpted the last 21 lines, and on listening to them, take note of the pauses Tree introduces, all of them marked with asterisks. For who would bear the whips and storms of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's consumely, the pangs of death I love, the Lord's delay, the insolence of office, and the stern, the chaste and merit of the unworthy faith. When he himself, mighty fight of make, who is a fair Who would father is there to grunt and sweat under a weary light? What does a dread of something after death? The undiscovered country from whose door no traveler returns. Puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. <sighs> that conscience doth make powers of it all and doth the native view of resolution which we cleared all with a pain after all. And enterprises of great distant moment, with this regard, their current turn arise and lose the name of action. The fall of me, in thy origin, we all might.
The recording exemplifies many convenient places for pauses, some of which are identical to those mentioned by John Hart in 1551, before prepositions, conjunctions, and relative pronouns. Tree also separates subjects from verbs, and near the end of the passage, places a pause between the adjective fair and the noun it modifies, Ophelia, a practice reminiscent of that employed by David Garrick, one of the greatest actors to grace the 18th century British stage. But in addition to exemplifying natural locations for pauses, Tree lets his voice drop before most of the stops, thus demonstrating the fall in tone referred to by Charles Butler in 1633. Singers followed the same practices as orators, and in 1538, Johannes Galiculus commented, Since in constructing a discourse, it is necessary to make certain silent distinctions, not only for the listener to comprehend the diverse clauses, but also for he who speaks to take breath, greatly invigorating his delivery, it is also necessary to do the same in singing. In 1542, a German musician wrote that a pause is the artistic omission of sound, invented both for the rest and breathing of singers and for the attractiveness of song. Singers in Italy also created space for pauses in the melodies they sang. For around 1630, the anonymous author of a treatise on opera staging and production stated, One should not sing continuously, even if there is no pause in the musical part, but at the end of every sense or thought, the singer should stop a while. To show how knowledge of pauses can help us recreate the sort of sung phrasing known in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, I'd like to begin by considering the punctuation marked in songbooks. John Dowland's first book of airs enjoyed a number of printings between 1597 and 1613, and for the final two editions, someone added many more points to the lyrics of specific pieces. In Awake Sweet Love, for example, the extra punctuation provides a detailed guide for singers to follow, not only by ordering the parts of the sentences into their proper relationship, but also by indicating the prominence singers might assign to the various members. The commas, then, divide Dowland's sentences into parts where, to use the words of John Hart, the matter hangs looking for much more to be said. In the example on the screen, the larger type represents the main sense, while the smaller italic type depicts short sayings, which interrupt it expand the overall meaning. These short sayings take on the nature of parenthetical remarks and might well be differentiated in their delivery through a lower, that is, quieter, voice. But as many songs survive in editions with relatively little punctuation, like those in Dowland's 1597 print, we must take on the task of identifying the convenient locations for pauses ourselves. We should begin the process of understanding the lyrics, first by writing out the words without punctuation, and then by marking all the places where it would be possible to introduce a pause. From the Campion song heard at the beginning of the video, I have selected the second, fourth, and fifth verses as examples of the process. In these verses, the convenient places for points are before conjunctions and relative pronouns, before and or after prepositional phrases, and between subjects and verbs, as well as verbs and complements, often a phrase functioning as an object. In the final line of the fifth verse, speakers and singers invariably would replace the missing verb between the words man and a woman with a pause. From among these possibilities, 
Daniel Thompson chose locations that suited his way of telling the song's story. In other words, he decided on places that fit his personification of the character. Daniel's choices enable him to enliven his delivery, even when, as this Campion song demonstrates, the lyrics progress to new words and thoughts, while the music repeats. Are the beauties others move in you I all graces find such is the effect of love to make them happy that are kind sweet afford me then your sight that surveying all your looks endless volumes i may write and fill the world with envied books which when after ages view all shall wonder and despair Woman to find man so true, or man a woman half so fair. The careful observation of points, along with the addition of stops in other convenient places, coupled with a change of delivery to suit the hierarchical importance of each member within those points, not only coherently arranges the ideas in the lyrics, but also creates variety between verses. Daniel's highly articulated phrasing adheres to the principles of early 17th century pointing. And in the words of Richard Mulcaster, this allows him to achieve a right and tunable uttering of the sentences. I close with a list of the sources cited in this video.